Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Fabulous to speak to you. Taisha. Thank you. So, I love your backdrop. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, I try as much as I can when I do have actual items, you know, to have them back there, uh, you know, and I have so many that I can't display even in the in the amount I have. So I had, I had to pick and choose, right? Very impressive. <laughs> so, Toby, I just want to jump off very briefly to kind of discuss how you got involved to be the one to finally bring a outsider's view for a lot of people into King Crimson. Uh, very simply, my parents live in the same town in the West Midlands in the UK, coincidentally the birthplace of heavy metal, um, as, um, as Robert and his wife Toya lived in. So I knew them socially. I'd made a documentary about archiving yourself for Radio 4 in the UK that Robert had participated in. So we'd done a little bit of work together. And I know he was um, very fond of my first film, The Man Whose Mind Exploded. So um, Robert put the proposal to me at Christmas 2017, I think it was, to see if I would be interested in making a film about King, King Crimson, as you, as you rightly identify, Matt, because I didn't know anything about them. Um, but I was capable of making a film at the same time. Well, I mean... This is this is a band with so much history that you know. A lot of people hear stories. I you know I'm I'm what I consider a fan, but not a fanatic. So there are certain things I never heard of. The you know I have a lot of friends who would have heard of, um, and so you kind of go in with this expectation of hearing certain things. And as far as the final product comes out, Tony, for you, do you feel that what was presented not only showed what you know the reality is, but maybe even open up your eyes to certain aspects of the thing you never saw because you were only looking at it from your specific vision and now you have another kind of person's vision illuminating what the band is. You're exactly right, but but in spades. I, I probably knew less than you about <laughs> what was going on in that band. I, I My jaw dropped continuously when I saw the documentary and, and uh, I think the, the big thing to me, I was relieved that I wasn't in it more because my kind of lighthearted flippant answers are okay in that's kind of the way I am but I didn't really realize the depth of of the conflicts and the dark stuff going on I, I was aware of some of it but uh, the film is very honest and it's very it just goes right in and it, and it uh, it's that's a great job of revealing a lot behind the band that to me is almost more important than just hearing the music again of King Crimson. The music, great, but uh, I, I learned a lot from it. And uh, frankly, it was a, quite an emotional experience for me seeing the, the the film, especially because it presented Bill Reithland, our wonderful, one of our drummers, uh, who was dying in the years and months we toured and knew it. And I never had those conversations with him. And, and Toby went right into the dressing room and said, so what's that like? And, and yeah. bless, bless him, bless them both. Uh, quite a film. Well, it's also interesting because you talk about, you know, describing your answers as lighthearted, you know, and it's, it's very easy for us all to believe as fans, you know, that, um, you know, that Robert, even even without his explanation of his, his work with Mr. Bennett, maybe made him uh, more um, mellowed out. You know, it, it's more so the fact that he's finally surrounded himself with these people who can do the work, but also have this much more joyous um you know you know feeling to themselves yeah yeah and, and and to sum up the way that experience was for me of of seeing yeah you know, being relieved that i wasn't in it more I, I felt like the good stuff that really juicy stuff that's making this film really good well that lies elsewhere and i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm quoting the boss there <laughs> in a different way but uh, if if i could interject there several oh, people have said um to me, Matt, they said, "Why? Well, why is not? Why is Tony Levin not in the film more?" And I've just said to them, "There's no drama without conflict, and and Tony's specialty <laughs> is is managing to just uh, avoid conflict." And at the same time, I, I, you know, I hope you agree with this, Tony. It's the um, I I was in uh, Louisiana recently, and I watched a Cajun band play, and one of the um, one of them was wearing a T-shirt that said, "Relax." The bass players here. <laughs> it is a bass player thing. You're correct. Yeah. Uh, uh, not all bass players, of course, and 
bless the guys who who break the the mold and, and take it in other places. But yes, it's a common trait in among bass players, or maybe that trait leads you to choose the bass. I don't know. Different movie. <laughs> Well, but going going back to that idea of people, you know, saying, well, how come there's not more Tony Levin in the film? Tony, though, plays part in what I fit, find to be the most introspective look at something. And also, Toby, I think w one of the most genius things you did as an editor in where first Tony's describing his kind of uh, displeasure, we'll call it, with the idea of originally calling the album Discipline when, when it came out because he saw it as punishment, then going the cut, not only the cut to Robert, not only necessarily giving the perfect explanation for the opposite side of it, but then the cut straight to him doing his fingering practicing while talking to Jacko, while showing that he has the discipline to do it and pay attention and be involved with somebody's discussion. Some of the most brilliant editing and documentary I've mm -hmm. seen in a long time. Well, that uh, that credit should go to Ollie Huddleston who, who edited the film, but certainly, I mean, there were so many moments um, like that where and and for me the one of my favorite bits in the film remains just hearing tony playing his his solo to moonchild on stage on his own mm -hmm. um but that comes in 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 the same way as as just what ro watching robert doing that incredible fingering and stuff is that it was important for me to to include in the film as much as i could these moments that fans would never have access to of seeing yeah. the band actually playing, but also you're, you're watching virtuoso musicians do, do what they do. There's a, there's a film by Henri Georges Clouseau called the Myst Le Mystère du Picasso, where in, in one sequence, he's painting on the other side of the screen and the ink sinks through. So you see these incredible drawings coming into being. And it's very rare that you actually get to see an artist do what they do or practice what they do in a way that's not necessarily performed for an audience. So it was really important for me to have um, those bits in. And then I think that with regard to the cut from Tony saying um, punishment, to, to cold showers. I don't think you have a better example of, of why the concept of discipline to, to an easygoing American might, might seem like punishment when you, somebody immediately is saying that cold showers is a very good example of, of, of discipline. But I think also it gives such a nice um, representation of that contrast between the, it's not contrast, it's yin and yang between the American and the English side of the bands or the British side of the band. It's, I think that's such an important dynamic in King Crimson. Tony, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to, because, you know, again, rewatching the documentary, I'm, I'm focusing on the certain points where um, a lot of the, a lot of the members are talking about, you know, even Robert's talking about like the minute changes that may happen through all of this practice and all and, and you know getting things down to a certain pattern and how in certain ways it feels like they're saying no improvisation but then a minute later it's like no there's a lot of improvisation or new things are breeded out of them are there certain aspects of these, these performances when you when you were doing them that you just like there are certain sections where i know not not that you're thinking about it but you know you know this is where i can open up a little bit more compared to just kind of hammering it down a little bit more Oh, sure. And, and I don't really think about it. Not, I don't think any of us need to think about it. it. It happens internally in some other way than than intellectualizing it. But there is plenty of uh, improvisation and changes more for some of us than for others and more on some pieces than for others. So for me, playing bass, lots of room on most of the pieces to do to just change night to night. Uh, I could try to change utterly, completely, but I don't have it in me uh, uh creatively but i changed quite a bit however for the three drummers they were all they had worked out parts they could there was some latitude within them and they had some sections where they okay it's just one drummer but largely they were all holding in their frustration and dealing with it in a very wonderful professional way the frustration is usually i'm the, the only guy and i can just play what i want but i got to play these parts so there's three guys in front of me on stage who have almost no room for improvisation. I had plenty. Next to me, Mel Collins had just loose cannon. He could do whatever I want. I, <laughs> I'd like to point out that the part of the the wonderful conflict in the in the nature of the band is you uh, when you see this film, you'll see Robert is it's his vision that 
even he might not understand it. It's very complex, but King Crimson is his vision, and he wants, very fervently wants it to be that. But it's also an improvisational band where each guy is kind of going off on his own, and to me it's the, the R&D chance of my lifetime because Crimson rehearses a huge amount, and it's the chance to try some crazy idea that I would never try in another context and maybe won't have time to develop or maybe it'll turn into something great. So that's going on. And Robert didn't ask for any of that. Mm. And 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 there's, there's a lot of conflict between the two of those. It comes across very well on the film, like all of the deeper, darker parts of the band. And maybe that's something to do with what why the band remained so creative for so many years. Well, and then going back to that, you know, those the deeper, darker parts of the band, you know, I, you know, I know there are a lot of fans that are going to have gone or will go into seeing this, you know, hoping to get certain answers for certain things. And it's not necessarily there to give them specific answers. And uh, Toby, in a lot of ways, you, you both um, give them something and, and, and take away something by, uh, again, you know, it may just be the cut by when Jacko is talking about how he first got recruited for the band and then him having that talk with Robert to where he mentions that, a specific person from the original lineup and then it cuts to the, the image of Michael, but then it goes through other people and it, and it may have been him saying it's myself. You know, we don't know. Was there ever pressure from either your side or wondering, you know, what the end of product that Robert may have wanted that you say, I have to do it a certain way to make sure that everybody's happy. It's very important to state that Robert has not in interfered in the creative process of making the film at all. He's, he's made a couple of comments but but I was never put under any kind of pressure, like over at all, subversive or any kind of pressure to to do anything other than what I thought was the best version of the film. And what was one of the comments you can't release this film? <laughs> <laughs> You're fired. Go home. Was that one of the comments? I'm just just curious. I'm just asking. Yeah. If you release this, we will kill you. <laughs> Apart from that, it's great. Um. So. So, but I did. I made the film twice um, because the first version wasn't wasn't good enough. But I think I think the best way to to answer your question is through the medium of aphorism, and that is that Robert is often often says we must find a, a different quality of problem. So, so the or better quality of problem rather. Um, and so the idea is is not to tell people. Um, what to think about King Crimson, particularly not, you know, the hardcore fan base, because they pretty much know everything that there is to know about King Crimson. Yeah. So I've had people complaining that there's not more sort of direct history of the band in the film, but that's, you know, there's a very good Wikipedia page, which tells you the basics. And then there's elephant talk and then the Reddit, you know, subreddits. And then of course there's Sid Smith's book. So there's, that material already exists. I think it was much more appropriate to give an idea of the experience of, of King Crimson in that sense, and and to present some of the the dilemmas that that members of the band face, you know, when they're playing and and when they're creating in that, and then give the audience a chance to discuss those things at, at the end of the film. I mean, the core question the film asks, and it's a question, not a statement, is are the sacrifices that you have to make as part of the creative process worth the results? And that's that 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 dynamic has has universal resonance, you know, it applies to whether you're making um, red or, you know, or a chocolate cake when it comes down to it. I mean, it's, you know, obviously there's a little more at stake with red, but, um, but it's, you know, they, these are things that we all face. And it's so, so I wanted to sort of explore that in the film rather than just presenting, you know, a particular version of history or telling people that this is what I think about King Crimson. No, I mean, that's that idea too of, you know, you can only look at it in so many different ways too, because you know we all make sacrifices for whatever it may be. But like, a, like a good for instance, Tony, you know the the story, you know you've even put it out there about the idea that John McLaughlin really wanted you as as, as the bass player for Mahavishnu Orchestra, but things didn't work out in a certain way, kind of by happenstance. So there's one band you could have been that that was the ideal for a lot of people as these are the best musicians in the world. 
And of course, while you have so much music that you work with outside of King Crimson and before and after, but here you are as part of King Crimson, as in the documentary, a lot of people say, this is the pinnacle. This is where people want to be. So, you know, that sacrifice comes in a lot of different angles, I guess, as well. And, and yeah. I'm just wondering if, 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 if any of that ever, like, sits in your mind. Oh, yeah, I, I think I, I'm sort of focused on the band and, and the film. So the, the experience of being uh, a, a sort of a freelance musician on any, any instrument is complex. And we could you, there could be a film about that and we could talk mm. for an hour about that. But it's rough when you have to choose between when none of us has enough offers of good music. You want to play the good music. And then suddenly you have two offers of good music. And and your whole life, your whole musical life will be, uh, you know, maybe I mentioned that I met Robert on Peter Gabriel, Robert Fripp on Peter Gabriel's solo album in 1976. And uh, uh, glad I showed up because I seem to still be making music with both of those gentlemen yeah. <laughs> in a lot of years. I, what if I had had the flu or what if, you know, I said, nah, I got this other session with a guy named Joe Smith. It's going to be great. Uh, so in the same sense of uh, John McLaughlin, I didn't didn't get to play with him. And I was I was playing in a band called the uh, Mike and the Rhythm Boys. It seemed like a better fit for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting, too, because, again, for as much work as you've done, I think there are probably certain people who would associate you mainly at first cr Crimson, maybe because they're just fans, King Crimson fans and so on and so forth. But have there been people who have come up to you? and wanted your work and almost in a lot of ways, like, cause even when you're in Crimson, like that base, that's you. That's not like you're, you're, you're as much as people want to say, oh. people are fitting into what Robert wants. That's you. That's, that's your sound. That's your tone. That's the way it comes off. But are there people who have reached out to you saying, I'd love to do you, work with you in a session, but I want that Crimson sound. Uh, some I'm, I'm in my, you see me in my studio and, and I do a lot of sessions from home for people. And uh, yeah, sometimes, they know me from King Crimson, and and the feedback is not coming from my studio, though. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was uh, me. Uh, an edit that was an editorial statement. You know, sometimes, if they've heard King Crimson, that's what they want. But if they heard me on uh, Judy Collins, uh, you know, Love and Roses album, and they want that, that's fine. I can do. I like doing that too. So, so I I played in different contexts, and uh, I, I think about King Crimson it's been the most challenging music of my life. And, and uh, I won't say the most rewarding, but extremely rewarding mm. because of the, the self challenge involved because of the learning how Robert runs a band. He's brilliant at that. And, and whatever bands I'm in and I have a chance to run, I, I, I take seriously the lessons I've learned from him about how to, some of the aspects of how to do it, but also, and probably most of all the great musicians who have been in the different incarnations that I've been part of, challenge me uh, not in so many words but i'm challenged to, to to up my game to be worthy of being in the band with them and that's been great for me as a musician as a creative artist so uh very very lucky to have been in the band yeah i mean to, to i'm gonna have to let you guys go so to wrap things up you know in a lot of ways and this is more of a statement that you both of you can speak to both one as a musician and toby as a filmmaker but you know i'm not trying to uh you know condone uh if somebody was really really awful or mean as a person but there's there is something to be said for those people who are you know quote unquote dictators when it comes to making art because it's like people want to think that edgar wright films are all improvised but no that's a hammer like the coen brothers it's a hammer it's like it's got to be done the way they want it done and you know there is a place for those people well could i say uh that could i go first because yeah, i wrote yeah. my word respect uh, a, a very important element of any band and that's there in King Crimson and Ben from when I joined it is the uh, that the musicians and leader and all have musical respect for each other. So my experience of working with Robert, even though I know he's particular about the end product, my experience has been that from the beginning, he, re he seemed to respect me as a musician and my bass parts. So I never felt like I got to please him. I felt like I have to be myself. And the other side of that is I respect his musical brilliance enough that when he has suggested things that seemed like a really bad idea to me and that's happened more than once mm. i i'll see it through to the end and i'll find out that it's not such a bad idea for instance in in the 90s when he had trey gunn and wonderful uh, stick 
touch guitar player and me both in the band hey it'll be great you'll you'll both do what you do whatever you do with the band well it made it really hard for us but what i didn't know uh, was what a great musician trey is so we were able to work out uh, we played certainly less than we would have otherwise but we mm. worked out stuff and the same again when he said well what tony how do you feel about playing with three drummers well, I didn't feel so great about it. I said, I don't even need to show up. It was my first thought. But I, I said, if that's your vision, Robert, I'm, I'm in. Thanks for having me. And it turned out to be a great idea, brilliant and very unusual idea. So that musical respect is a big part of what makes the band a, a tolerable experience when things get rough. So is there anything you wanted to add before we go to, along those lines? Um, just that, just that I, I've not really seen Robert behave as an autocrat or a dictator in the way that people, you know, often talk about him. I mean, I think he's capable of, um, creating a, um, a, an extraordinary and a very demanding creative space, but at the same time in terms, you know, if, if there's, if there was something less than ideal about that i would say that it has to do with um a, a lack of instruction a, you know a lack of understanding of, of what the parameters are my experience is different obviously because i'm in the king crimson creative space simultaneously um as anybody who's heard me play will tell you i'm not a musician yeah. so so i'm not in there to do that and also you know, no one's making a direct judgment as to whether the thing that I've come up with is the right thing, you know, and yeah. but the thing that that Tony said, you know, is very true that that the the respect for, for my creative process and what I ended up making has been very high in a good way. You know, gentlemen, I'd love to keep talking to you forever, but I got to let you go. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, man. Thank good to meet you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Cheers.